Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? Nintendo is at it again with a new retro-themed game console. But it's limited, both in features and availability. So, is it worth trying to track one down? This is the Nintendo Super Mario Bros. Game & Watch. It's a modern throwback to the company's first handheld game console, which debuted in 1980. But instead of playing a simple LCD game, it features what's perhaps Nintendo's most recognizable title, Super Mario Bros. as it appeared on the NES and Famicom. There isn't much in the box, just the console and a short USB cable for charging. The housing is made out of plastic, though the faceplate is metal, and this burgundy and gold color scheme is faithful to the original. The right side has the power button and USB Type-C charging port, while the left side only has a small opening for the speaker. It first powers on to a rather entertaining clock. It rotates through several backgrounds, with Mario running through and defeating enemies. What most people are here for, though, is the game part of the Game & Watch. And despite its compact size, it works surprisingly well in that regard. Super Mario Bros. plays smoothly and without any glitches or visual artifacts. It's responsive and true to the original with some small modern conveniences. If you turn the console off or it goes to sleep, it'll let you pick up where you left off. But there aren't any save states, so if you game over, you're starting again from the beginning. Pressing pause slash set lets you adjust the volume and brightness, and also lets you check the time and battery gauge. The display itself is bright and decently saturated. It's also nice and sharp. Nintendo did its homework here in picking a screen that was the right resolution to not need interpolation. I didn't notice any serious ghosting or screen tearing either, but some people are more sensitive to that sort of thing than I am. The sound quality from this console is surprisingly good given its size. It's rich and gets quite loud. The controls and ergonomics, unfortunately, are a bit of a mixed bag. The D-pad is plastic and has that classic Nintendo feel of being slightly clicky and reassuring. The action buttons try to have the same thing going, but they're made of a rubbery material and are a little too soft for my taste. Granted, this was done so they'd match the buttons on the original Game & Watch, and perhaps I'm being a bit too picky. While somewhat mushy, they do work just fine. Considering the console's boxy shape, it's not the most comfortable thing to hold for long periods, but the chamfered edges do help. And the speaker is thankfully out of the way, so you're unlikely to block it while playing. There are two additional games other than Mario Brothers. One is the original Mario 2, better known outside Japan as The Lost Levels, and a much more difficult game than the first. The other is a throwback to the first Game & Watch called Ball. The idea is simple, keep juggling the balls as they move faster and faster without dropping them. And the packaging plays homage to it as well, with alternative labeling underneath the outer plastic sleeve. I was curious as to what made this handheld work, so I gathered my tools to find out. There are four tri-wing screws holding the back cover on, and between their finish and the fact they didn't stick to my magnetic screwdriver, I think they're made from aluminum. Lifting the back panel gives a good look at the components inside, the most obvious being the battery. It takes up about a quarter of the console's interior volume, and at 525 milliamp hours, it very likely could hit the eight hours of gaming time that Nintendo promises. I was happy to see that the battery uses a snap-in connector, making it easier to replace later on without needing special tools. 
That modularity doesn't extend to the speaker, though. Its wires are soldered to the board. The driver itself is bigger than I expected and set at an angle so it fires into a chamber that leads to the opening on the side. That's how this console sounds so decent. Another nice touch is this metal bracket. It helps take the stress off the USB port when cables are inserted and removed. And just like with Nintendo's other handhelds, there's a water indicating warranty sticker in here too. Onto the brains of the operation. It comes in the form of a system on a chip from ST Micro and does almost everything. It features a 280 MHz ARM Cortex M7 CPU along with a bit over a megabyte of RAM. It also integrates an LCD screen controller, various peripheral interfaces for things like the buttons, and even the DAC and op amp for the speaker. This SoC's only real limitation is its 128 kilobytes of built-in flash memory. But that's where the IC next to it comes into play. It's a flash chip from Acronix, and while it's 8 megabits, or 1 megabyte, of capacity seems tiny, remember that Super Mario was designed to fit on a cartridge that could hold at most 40 kilobytes. So this console's designers likely had plenty of space left for its small embedded operating system. The only other chip of note is this battery charge controller from Texas Instruments, which is similar to ones that Nintendo has used in the 3DS series. I wanted to see if there were any other chips on the back side of the PCB, so I disconnected the display's flat flex cables one for video and the other for controlling the backlight, along with the battery. A number of screws hold in the motherboard, especially in the area around the buttons. This helps give the buttons a firmer feel by preventing the board from flexing, and the inside of the back cover has these circular reinforcements to help with that as well. I flip the board over and, well, there's really nothing here. No additional chips or even passive components like capacitors or resistors. Just the button contacts, which use a traditional arrangement of a silicone membrane that shorts two pads when pressed. The only part left is the screen, which sits underneath this plastic middle frame. It's from a company called Inilux, but I couldn't find a datasheet for its specific part number. It's a little less than two and a half inches in diagonal, and poking around on their website shows that they only list one display in that size. There are two versions, portrait and landscape, but they have the same resolution of 320 by 240. It's possible the screen in the Game & Watch is this one, but it's also just as likely that it was custom made to Nintendo's specifications. And this wouldn't be the first time that's happened. No doubt some will be curious as to whether they can load other games on the Game & Watch. Just to get the obvious out of the way, I hooked the console up to my laptop and nothing happened. The computer didn't recognize it, though at least the Game & Watch was able to charge. This may change, just as the NES and Super NES Classic Edition consoles were locked down from the factory, but ultimately jailbroken by gaming enthusiasts, the same could be in store for the Game & Watch, though Nintendo may have made it not so easy this time. But the bigger challenge is also the most frustrating thing about this handheld, just getting one to begin with. Like its other retro consoles, Nintendo is selling it as a limited edition product. According to the company, it'll only be available until the spring of 2021, and they're not saying just how many will be made. I was lucky enough to pick mine up on launch day, but it's unknown how frequently it'll be restocked. This is, of course, very frustrating from a consumer standpoint, but I'm not sure that demand will significantly exceed supply this time. Because of its limited features, I think the Game & Watch targets a narrower audience. A console like the NES Classic Edition is appealing to enthusiasts and casual gamers alike, those looking at its collectability, but also those wanting a simple hit of nostalgia. The Game & Watch, on the other hand, seems to lean more heavily on that collector angle. 
With a wider selection of games, I could see it getting more attention, but at least at its launch, there's no sign that other versions are being planned. It's a one-trick pony, and that's not something casual gamers are necessarily looking for. The upshot is that it's priced pretty reasonably at $50 US, and for the money, it's a solid product. There are lots of little touches, from the thank you on the box flap, to the fact that the clock's background changes with the time of day. So while many may look to pick one up for its novelty or collectability, there's also some substance to it, as limited as it is. So is it fun to play? Absolutely. As long as you're in the mood for Mario. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.